problem. We're going to find out that, hey, you can really heal people by sending them light and to holding them in the highest light. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. Instead of alternative healing methods, because it's, it's time. It's time. And so there are two or three subjects that really interest me. Uh, and those subjects, a lot of folks are interested in subjects of, you know, money, relationship, health, those kind of things that uh, I'd like to explore with you all tonight and start out by telling you that I used to live in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. There is a, it's in down in the four corners and there's a sign when you come into the town of Pagosa Springs that says the best of Colorado and it is. It is just a gorgeous small town nestled right in the heart of the Rockies outside of Durango there. And every day I would take a walk. That's how I get my exercise. Tina is a, a teacher of aqua aerobics in the natural volcanic warm ponds on the big island of Hawaii. That's what she does for a living. And the beautiful Pacific Ocean laps up over the the shore there, and uh, and she and the ladies are out there exercising in the warm ponds. It's it's idyllic. And Vicky rebounds, gets on this little trampoline, goes forever. I don't know how she does it. Richard jogs, just comes into town, runs along the river. I take walks. And so in Pagosa Springs, I would take a walk every day. And it's a, around a, a lake, and it's a couple mile walk. And I would take it rain or, or shine or seven feet of snow. Just a, a beautiful walk. And on the back side of the lake is a house. And in the yard of the house is a dog house. And tied to the dog house by a chain is a, a small dog. He's uh, about that high. and. He's a reddish brown. He looks like part collie, part chow. I call him Rusty. I don't know what his name is. He's rust colored. And nice animal. And for the three years that I was living in Pagosa Springs, every day I would take a walk and I'd come up and talk with him and give him a pat on the head. And, and by the time the three years was up, I had a telepathic communication going on with him. And, uh, um, and when I first moved there, Rusty was uh, full of spunk and spark and spirit, younger, of course. But after three years of sitting on the chain in all kinds of weather, why, his spirit began to wane. And the only time that he would be uh, uh, perked up is when I'd come by to give him a pat and chat with him for a second, or when the owner would come home from work in the evening and come out with a bowl of food. Other than that, he just sort of laid there. And it, it snows heavily in Pagosa. So one day, I'm taking my walk. And it's in the evening. And it's in March. And there's still two, three, four inches of snow in spots on the ground. And the owner has gotten home. And he takes the bowl of food out to Rusty. And Rusty perks up, runs to the length of the chain. And the chain breaks. And the dog immediately <laughs> figures out what's going on. There's a grove of aspen trees about 30, 40 feet away. The dog runs over in front of the grove of aspen trees, and he's pacing back and forth. And he's looking in the aspens, and he's looking back at the owner who's calling him, and looking back into the trees and inching toward the trees. And i got to tell you, I'm rooting for the dog. <laughs> because I know that life Taking your chances out in the unknown is better any day of the week than being on the chain. That when a person steps into the unknown of life, that's when the adventure rears its beautiful head. So I'm rooting for the dog. And he's looking into the woods. And so and the sun is starting to go down. The owner, owner finally goes back into the house, and he comes back out a couple minutes later with a bag of treats. And he shakes them over his head, shaking them over his head. And long story short, within about five minutes, the dog is back on the chain. <sighs> 
The following day, I'm taking my walk. It's <clears throat> earlier. Earlier, it's uh, mid-afternoon. And I get around to the where the doghouse is, and, the, and Rusty's there on the chain. And I walk up, and I get a closer look, and I see that it's a new chain. This time, the links are thicker. The chain itself is a little shorter than the old one. And he's just sort of laying there. And he perks up to see me. And uh, as I say, we've got this telepathic communication and, uh, going on. And I asked him, I said, hey, Russ, I said, what's going on here? How come you keep falling for those same old treats and tricks again? And he said, he said that just quick as a wink, this instantaneous message comes back into my mind. He says this to me. He says, hey, Tone. He says, how about you unclip this chain from around my neck, and we'll see if I keep falling for those same old tricks again. Better not tell you what I did. <laughs> Suffice it to say that we all keep falling for some of those same old tricks again. And you know what they are. All you have to do is turn on the TV for five minutes and you start seeing those same old tricks and same old stories and we keep buying into them, believing that's the way our world works. An interesting thing about realities is that we have the choice at any given moment to choose amongst an infinite number of realities to put our attention on and yet we keep buying into the one that we've been sold since day one, the one that keeps the consensus reality, the matrix, the mainstream, whatever you want to call it. And, and that's all right, but is it still serving us? Is it giving us what we're really looking for? Or does it keep us unempowered? Because in these groups, what we're talking about is stepping into our own power via making intentions and seeing them manifest and making them again and seeing them manifest again until we get confident with it, until we see this process work over and over, until we realize that um, we are proficient at manifesting. And I think that's the first thing that, I, that we and the intenders have looked at now and said that there are two things that there are very important for us to look at nowadays. The first is to get proficient at manifesting, not just dabble with it or fiddle around with it or play around with it, but get good at getting that which we desire to come to us as easily and effortlessly as possible. Because until we do that, we remain at the mercy of people and forces outside ourselves who may not care in the least about us. So getting good at manifesting, that's number one. And it is our God-given birthright to be amazing creators. We are magnificent creators who have abdicated our place upon the throne of our own power because we bought into the prevailing realities. But those days are going away. We're not opposing them. We're not saying anybody out there is doing anything wrong. We're just saying, hey, it works like this, so we're going to start doing what works. Get up in the morning and say your intentions. Get together with a group of people in a, in a circle every so often and put intentions in a circle because it magnifies and multiplies your intentions when you get somebody else to align with you and, and envision your intentions manifesting too. And that brings up the second thing that we learned in the intenders. And it is that if, it, if we're going to create the peace and the freedom and the joy and the grace and the abundance that we deserve as being humans upon this planet and that we long for, why it's time for us and it's wise for us to begin to come together and work together in community. There is strength in numbers. And again, when you get somebody else to support you in the manifestation of your dreams, ah, and if you can get 10 people to support you in the manifestation of your dreams, even better. So, I want to talk about a couple of those same old tricks that we keep falling for. And